everyone, I'm Julie and welcome to Advent Eve 2, where our focus is on peace. I don't know about you, but with politics, quarantine, with COVID-induced stress, this year is the furthest from peace I think I've ever experienced in my life. And because of this lack of peace, I have felt burnt out, stressed out, exhausted, and everything in between. What I want to talk about today is maybe not the first thing that will come to your mind when you think about peace. I'm going to be talking about peace within yourself. Am I sounding a little kumbaya yet? Well, hang with me. In this sermon, I want to encourage you that only pursuing good emotions does not necessarily equal peace. Emotions have no moral value. And you can express difficult emotions in a God-honoring way. We'll actually look at examples of Jesus doing that. You do not have to feel only positive emotions to be a good Christian or for God to love you. Peace can be found through processing your emotions rather than running from your emotions. This year, I know I have felt bad in a million different ways. And if that wasn't bad enough, I have felt bad about feeling bad. I talked about this a little last week. I've been struggling with postpartum depression. And a huge short source of shame is the fact that I feel guilty about feeling depressed. And when I do this, I start shooting myself. I should be feeling a certain way. And when I do that, I begin to feel feelings about my feelings. You guys still tracking? Instead of just feeling sad, I feel guilty about feeling sad. So instead of just processing through one difficult emotion, sadness, I am piling another difficult emotion, guilt, on top. If you have never experienced this, first of all, you gotta tell me your secrets. But second, let me just tell you, it is an exhausting, shame-filled cycle. At the root of that shoulding, our feeling, feelings about certain feelings, is a belief about the morality of emotions. We have a tendency to label emotions as good or bad. Last week we talked about depression, that obviously falls under the bad category. To take it further, we label fear, anxiety, sadness, and anger as bad. And I really don't think I need to push or expand on this point any further because no one is actively seeking out these emotions. They are less desirable to us than joy, peace, or love. But just because these emotions are less desirable does not make them evil. Emotions in and of themselves have no moral value. No emotion is necessarily good, and none are necessarily bad. What we choose to do with these emotions is where that moral value gets added in. But we don't see this truth that emotions have no moral value lived out in our world. We still strive to push away those bad emotions as quickly as possible. And a lot of times we have the wrong view of the role that emotions play in our lives. The two most extreme views are emotions are bad and need to be ignored. And on the other extreme is emotions are my company and I do whatever they say. From what I've already said, maybe you think I'm on that team emotion side. Um, I'm not. I do believe that pushing away every negative emotion and shooting yourself leads to false peace. It'll lead to a disconnect between the real emotions that you're feeling and how you're trying to convince yourself that you should feel. But on the other hand, if you are just following all of your emotions blindly, you're going to be a bull in a china shop in every relationship that you have. I am of the strong belief 
that the answer lies somewhere in the middle. Emotions are not the end-all be-all, but they are also not the enemy. So what are they? Emotions are information. Emotions can tell us about our goals and our values. Emotions can be warning signs when we feel mistreated. When we understand that emotions are information, as opposed to them being a compass or ultimate evil, we can use them as tools to understand ourselves, to set boundaries, and to clarify what we truly value. Without this balance, we can be thrown off and land on either extreme end of the spectrum. If we think emotions are bad, we can try to stuff down any negative feelings and try and sweep them under the rug. If we think emotions are absolute truth, we can react in whatever way the wind is blowing that day. Again, I want to repeat, emotions are information. My husband Austin said this to me, pain is necessary to know when something isn't right. Just like our body sends pain to our brain when we place our hand on a hot stove, our emotions can send us pain as a warning sign, as information that something is not right and something needs to be mended. So we have a choice. We can keep our hand on that hot stove and pretend it doesn't hurt, which would be shooting, or we can take our hand off of the stove. Processing through those emotions and then moving on. Treating our emotions as more or less than information can direct us to false peace. Because life is hard, there is sin in the world, chasing after only desirable emotions will never lead to true peace. True peace is experienced when we process through emotions, not when we run from emotions. When we see emotions as information, our reaction to them changes. Last week I mentioned that a lot of people get the feeling from Christians that emotions such as depression, anxiety, sadness, fear, and anger are equated with a lack of trust in God. When we change our perspective, when we see emotions as information as opposed to absolute truth or absolute evil, our emotional reactions to difficult life circumstances loses that sting. I want to walk you through examples of Jesus, wisdom from Solomon, as well as a passage from Hosea to help you see that true peace is possible not only in those desirable emotions, but true peace is actually birthed through the healthy expression of difficult emotions. In Ecclesiastes 3, Solomon tells us that there is a time for everything, a time for all emotions. In verse 4, he says that there is a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. There is a time to express sorrow. Solomon, we believe as Christians that he is the wisest person who's ever lived. Solomon said that there is a time for mourning. There is space within your relationship with God to express sadness. There is space within your relationship with God to express fear. There is space within your relationship with God to express anger. There is space within your relationship with God to express doubt. In Ephesians 4, 26a, the NIV translation says this, In your anger, do not sin. And I want to look at other translations because I feel like the assumption that's connected with this verse is, don't be angry and you won't sin. But this isn't the point. The ESV translation says this, Be angry and do not sin. The NLT version says this, Don't let sin... Don't sin by letting anger control you. 
The Amplified Bible says this, Be angry at sin, at immorality, at injustice, at ungodly behavior, yet do not sin. Being angry is not the sin. As I said, the emotion of anger has no moral value. Paul tells us not to react to a morally neutral emotion, anger, in a sinful way. I'm going to repeat that. Paul tells us not to react to a morally neutral emotion in a sinful way. The emotion of anger in and of itself is not a sin. Paul even says, be angry, but do not sin. Both parts of this statement are important. Feel your emotions, but don't react to those emotions in a sinful way. Jesus also shows us through his tears and emotional distress that having a sorrow or anxiety-filled reaction is not sinful even though in these circumstances, Jesus knew the end of the story. In John 11, we read about the death of Lazarus. Jesus was close with Lazarus, as well as his sisters, Mary and Martha. And he was told about Lazarus getting sick. But still, Jesus remained in a different town, and Lazarus died. Jesus heard of this, and he went to Bethany, where they lived. I'm going to pick up at John 11, 32 through 35. It says this. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and she saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Maybe you've heard that last verse. It's the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. But here's the thing. Jesus brought Lazarus back to life. And this wasn't a surprise to him. It wasn't like, whoa, I did it. You know, in verse 11, Jesus says that Lazarus is asleep and he's going to go wake him up. So Jesus knew he was going to bring Lazarus back to life. Jesus knew that Lazarus was going to be okay. Jesus knew the outcome. And still, he wept. Still, he wept. Jesus knew the outcome of this situation. Jesus could have looked around and said, All right, all right, everybody. Like, I'm here. Don't worry. He'll be fine. Stop crying and let's get on with it. I'll bring him back to life. Come on. Like, he could have done that. And I can think of times when I have experienced that kind of response from other people. And it can come from a kind and a well-meaning heart. But it still isn't helpful. We'll talk more about cultivating empathy in the love sermon but well-meaning responses that try to, to diminish emotions are hurtful. And I want to say that again just to be clear. Well-meaning responses that try to diminish emotions are hurtful. Saying God is in control will always be true, but it's not helpful when it's used to try and push someone out of their struggle with stress, or sadness, or anxiety, or fear. And we can see from this example of Jesus that he did not do this. He didn't rush the crowd out of their emotional response by spouting off facts or telling them how they should be feeling. Jesus wept with them. And this was not a bad response. This was a healthy response. Even though he knew that Lazarus would rise from the dead, Jesus did not let facts stop his emotional response. And that emotional response did not make Jesus any less the Son of God. That emotional response did not make Jesus sinful. Having an emotional reaction does not equal 
a lack of faith. Before Jesus was crucified, he took his disciples to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I'm going to read to you from the Amplified Bible, Luke 22, 42-44. We see Jesus praying this. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup of divine wrath from me. Yet not my will, but always yours be done. Now an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in deep agony, deeply distressed and anguished, almost to the point of death, he prayed more intently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling on the ground. Jesus was not happy about dying. In this passage, we see a person willing to do what God wants done, but he sure as heck don't look happy about it. Jesus is having an emotional reaction that is described for us in verse 44. Agony, deep distress, almost to the point of death. And he is having this reaction after he has been strengthened by an angel. From a psychological perspective, Jesus could be experiencing extreme anxiety or maybe even a panic attack. And in this situation, again, Jesus knew the ending. Jesus knew that his death would be temporary and that it would be for the good of all. Just as with Lazarus, Jesus knew the ending. He knew that God wins in the end. And yet, he experienced emotional agony almost to the point of death. And yet, he wept. Jesus did not let facts stop his emotional response. And opposed to lies, that tell me that I should only feel specific emotions. I see my Lord and Savior expressing sorrow, expressing, expressing anxiety, and not sinning. When I read this, I don't see a man who is sinning. I don't see a man who is doubting God. I don't see a man who is lacking faith. I see Jesus, the Son of God, expressing real and raw human emotions. And there is absolutely nothing wrong or sinful with that. I am so thankful for these examples and the reminders that come with them that within my relationship with God, there is room for all emotions. Because having an emotional reaction does not equal a lack of faith. In Hosea 6.6, 6, God speaks to Israel through the prophet Hosea saying this, For I desire and delight in steadfast loyalty rather than sacrifice, and in the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Now, sacrifices and burnt offerings, they're not bad. And they were things that were imperative to a relationship between God and an Israelite at that time. But we can see that God wants something more. He desires something above his people going through the motions, only doing the actions. What God desires is our hearts. And here's the thing. God knows that our hearts are full of some mixed up, messed up, really, really hard emotions. Hebrews 4.15 tells us that Jesus understands what it's like to be human. To take that a step further, we have looked at how Jesus understood and experienced these hard emotions. God doesn't speak through Hosea and say, I want your faithfulness and your loyalty but only when you get it together, only when you stop feeling that anger, only when you aren't experiencing anxiety or depression. No, God wants all of us. There is space within your relationship with God for all emotions. As I've mentioned a million times, and I'm sure that you can relate to, this year has been rough. 
In the spring, when I was about eight and a half months pregnant, I was in major nesting mode, and I had just been through a lot of hurt. I was cleaning with the power of a full-grown woman, an eight-pound baby, and a conversation with God that I was trying to avoid. I put on my Jesus playlist because I was hoping that listening to some happy little music would just fix everything and I wouldn't have to talk to God about it. So I rage scrubbed my bathroom. I organized all these tiny little baby socks and I hung stuff up on the wall and finally I glared at my phone as a song sung about how God was such a good friend. I slammed my finger on the pause button. I looked up at the ceiling and yelled, you don't feel like a good friend. You feel like a really crappy friend. And since I'm being honest, I didn't say the word crappy. What followed was the most real, authentic, hurt conversation with God that I've ever had in my life. I cried during that conversation about how I felt abandoned, hurt, and alone. And you know what? Having that conversation, being honest about how I felt, it helped my heart heal more than any of those happy praise songs ever could. Before, I was feeling angry and bitter as I listened to what felt like empty words and unkept promises sung on my Jesus playlist. I was able to get to the point of joy because I walked through and expressed a difficult emotion. After I had a difficult conversation and expressed difficult emotions to God, I was able to sing those praise songs again. This time, coming from a place of peace birthed from sorrow, joy birthed from pain. I was able to find peace through the expressive expression of my emotions rather than trying to run from my emotions. Christmas can carry some heavy expectations. Christmas can carry the weight of a hundred shoulds. When we hear words like hope, peace, joy, and love during Advent, we can feel those shoulds weighing heavy on our shoulders. I should be happy. I should be excited. I should feel the magic of the season. You might feel like you should feel a certain way because in the end, God wins, so why should I feel upset, anxious, angry? Friends, I wanna tell you that it's okay if you're experiencing difficult emotions this Christmas. It's okay if you don't even understand what you're feeling. Paul tells us, be angry, but do not sin. Feel your emotions, but don't have a sinful response. Your emotions, wherever they may be right now, they have no moral value. Your emotions are information. You can feel them, you can express them, and not sin. You can express, like Jesus did, sorrow and anxiety in a God-honoring way. Friends, this Christmas season, I pray that you find peace through processing emotions rather than peace apart from your emotions. I heard a quote on the radio the other day I can't find the author, but I really wanted to share it. It says, you need to feel it to heal it. I pray that this Christmas season can be a time where instead of running from your emotions, you run towards healing. You run towards rest. You run towards peace. You run towards